Hello literature students, my name is Mr Beasley and in this sequence of videos we're going to have a look at probably one of my all-time favourite poems, which is Lamia by John Keats. And if you've watched any of my other videos on Keats, and there are a couple, you'll know that he falls into the category of romantic poet, and that is romantic with a capital R as opposed to the sort of gestures you might receive from an admirer on Valentine's Day. Romanticism was in some ways a reaction to a philosophical movement known as the Enlightenment, which began sometime around 1640. The movement placed great emphasis on the importance of reason, which is why it's sometimes referred to as the Age of Reason. The philosopher Descartes had recently written the very famous I Think, Therefore I Am, and other familiar names associated with the Enlightenment and were very prominent at this time include the scientist Isaac Newton and the writer and philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Romanticism, on the other hand, was an artistic, aesthetic and poetic movement which valued the power of the imagination, emotional spontaneity, the spiritual and even the supernatural. And the reason why I'm mentioning all this at the beginning is because in many ways Lamia is a poem in which these two philosophical belief systems come into conflict. Scientific reason versus the imagination. The poem Lamia contains themes that were very popular with Keats and that can be found in many of his other works. Transgressing or breaking through boundaries, dreams versus reality and transformations, both physical and emotionally, such as from pain to pleasure. Although it should be pointed out that as far as Keats was concerned, these two emotional states were interconnected and one could not exist without the other. I mean, just have a look at a short extract from a poem called Ode on Melancholy, where in stanza three he writes, and he's he's addressing, he's talking to melancholy here, and he says, She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die, and joy whose hand is ever at his lips, bidding adieu, an aching pleasure nigh, turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. This first video is going to give you an introduction to the poem and analysis up to line 12 of Lamia, the first eight lines of which are printed here for you. And you can see that the poem begins a bit like a fairy tale and then establishes the setting which is firmly placed in the past. And you can see the word before being repeated twice in the opening few lines. This is a time of gods and mythical creatures. An imagined time before the Greek deities of Nymph <clears throat> and Satyr were driven out of the forests by the more modern folklore of fairies. And in folklore, Oberon was the king of the fairies. And you can see an artist's impression of him here. With his diadem, which is a, a sort of crown, his scepter, which is like a staff, and mantle, which is like a cape. Now, a nymph is a female creature from Greek mythology, usually associated with nature, while a satyr also comes from the Greek myths, but is male and associated with sexual desire. Both these creatures were believed to inhabit woodland. And when you put these three ideas together, you've got a pretty decent overview of what the opening of the poem is about. It's set in woodland, specifically the woods on the large Greek island of Crete. And you have a female character being pursued by an amorous male god. The woodland setting is most obviously introduced in line two and is then developed with the description of rushes, green and brakes and cowslip lawns, where brake 
refers to an area of dense undergrowth. And the fact that the poem is set in Greece is important because Keats drew inspiration from Greek mythology and at the beginning of the poem, in particular, the god Hermes. Now, Hermes is important and a central character in the first 145 lines of the poem. He is an Olympian god and a messenger. He's able to move quickly because of the winged sandals he wears and as such he is able to move between or cross the boundaries between the mortal world and the godly world of Mount Olympus. Hermes is often depicted as youthful with a significant sexual appetite and Greek mythology tells of him having affairs with both mortal and mythical creatures. On line 7, he's described here as the ever-smitten Hermes, which basically means he's always on the hunt for his next sexual conquest. He carries a staff, which is actually referred to in line 89 of the poem, which features two snakes copulating, a symbol of both fertility and sexual appetite. The action of the poem begins with Hermes leaving his golden throne bent warm on amorous theft. Now, warmth in Keats's poetry is often linked to sexual desire, as you will know if you've studied the Eve of St Agnes. What is troubling here is the inclusion of the word theft at the end of the line, which suggests that he is in pursuit of a female and he means to get her even if it must be by trickery or force. He has stolen light, so the setting of his pursuit is in darkness and so that he may not be seen by Zeus, the king of the gods, who may well not approve of his behaviour. But even the word stolen here suggests theft. Hermes then disappears into a forest on the shores of Crete in pursuit of the nymph. But what he finds initially is not the object of his desire, but Lamia. <laughs> 